Hello, we have a beautiful sunny day today. It's just gorgeous. Um, and it's really helped me today to kind of sift through a lot of the stuff that's been coming out um, on the news today and to make some sense of it. So this um, little video today is in two parts. And the first is just about thinking about risk as we all have to do every day. And the second part is about what's going on in the world today and trying to um, untangle some of the information and misinformation that's going on at the moment. I feel like I should have my shades on. It's very, very bright. Um, but I think, uh, so basically, the first thing I want to talk about is it can be very, very confusing at the moment. And uh, it's taken me quite a long time today to find a place of understanding exactly where, how much risk and what types of risks that I want to make take at the moment. And this is a very basic question that we have every day, all the time. And we get used to some of it. And also some of it, we, we sort of get into our comfort zone and what we're used to doing. And then when we're, we're faced with a new choice, a new situation, we find it very, very difficult to make sense of things. And unfortunately, at the moment, I feel like we're getting a lot of confusion coming from government bodies and from especially the media, which I'll talk about as well. And uh, so... <laughs> The problem is that we, we feel like we're being constantly faced with a new situa situation every day. And um, actually, this is kind of like where I was at when I was traveling around. And what was most difficult was actually leaving my home in uh, Wimbledon and actually making the decision to leave my flat and go out and get into the world. And that was really quite terrifying for me. And it was quite terrifying to get on a plane and go somewhere different. But... What I discovered through all of it was learning how to listen to my intuition and my instinct, learning how to listen to my body when it said, yes, I want to do this, no, I don't want to do this, and understanding the differences between a sort of knee-jerk reaction um, and, and actually the intuition down deep below. Now, at the moment, we're kind of being faced with lots of questions about what kind of risks do we take? Do we get on a train and go to London? Um, do we go and visit grandma, basically, is the big question at the moment. And that's a big question in my life as well. And the thing is, it seems very new and scary. But we face questions like this every single day. But we're used to those questions. So, for example, if I'm driving a car and I come up to a junction, I make a decision whether it's safe to pull out or not. And that affects me and it affects other road users. It affects cyclists, pedestrians, everybody like that. So I have to come up to the junction, look around and make a sensible decision. And it's a split second decision as well. Um, and we, we have to do that all the time in life. And it's no different with, with what we're dealing with. So we can be kind of sensible and we can think about the risk, but at the same time, we've also got to be aware and it's like we're driving on the motorway, you've got to be aware of the things you can see and the things you can't see. So, for example, we travel at a reasonable speed, so if you hit a patch of ice or water or oil that you can't see, you can control the skid. Or you're not travelling so far over the speed limit that it becomes catastrophic. So these are the kind of decisions that we have to make every day. And... One of the things that I've learned in life is very often when we seek to control or stay in our comfort zone and stay safe, that's really our ego talking. And when we explore and we get out there, that's really our, our spirit. But we're not talking about taking crazy risks or, or being inconsiderate to anybody else. What, we talk, what I'm talking about is trusting your instinct and your intuition and not listening so much to all the other voices and all the other people trying to tell us what to do that we lose sight of our own intelligence, our own wisdom, our own sensibleness, even though that's not a word. I think my grandma would approve of the word sensibleness. So, and I said to her today, I said, this must have been what it was like for you when war was breaking out, when suddenly everything was changing and all the rules were changing. So for example, 
people when when it was in World War Two in England had to start thinking about things like blackout. So blacking out your curtains and your windows to make sure that people couldn't see your light. And it wasn't just for you, it was for your whole town and your whole village that if you controlled that light, people couldn't see, you know, bombers couldn't see where to drop the bombs. So that was a whole new mindset that people had to get their head around. And they had wardens coming around and telling them, no, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I'm sure that there were fines and things like that. And probably a lot of social, what's the word, criticism if you didn't do your blackout right, you know. And, and many other things like hoarding, like rationing, all those kind of things. And also volunteering, being part of a community spirit. And those are the kind of things when we have to shift our mindset, we have to start thinking about what's right for us today, what's right for our community today, and, and what we can what we need to let go of as well. And I think that's very important. But um, and that's something that, that we have to really be sensible and and think clearly. And we do need good information in order to make correct decisions. Now, when I was traveling, one thing I was always, always doing was checking the government travel website. And this was obviously way before the virus hit. But there were many times where my decisions would change because the UK government website would say, this area is not safe to go to here. This area is not safe here. And so instead of taking a train, I would take a plane. Instead of um, going to one region, I would go to another one. And instead of, in one case, it was like, do I hire a car in Mexico? And instead, what I did was I took the buses because um, people were targeting uh, those who were hiring vehicles, the tourists hiring vehicles. And I also had to do that in Johannesburg. I took a plane from Johannesburg to Durban rather than renting a car, but then I drove back. I rented a car in Durban and drove back because that was much safer than going the other way. So... Sometimes what I say may seem like I'm being very casual or I'm not taking risks carefully, seriously, and that's absolutely not the case because um, once you start to travel and travel in certain regions, you have to be so aware of changing situations, changing culture, and what's safe to do here. Is it safe to drink the water here? No. Is it safe to drink the water here? Yes. We have to be aware every day of things that are changing. Having said that, I am finding this moment in England extremely confusing in terms of advice. And it's very hard to know what to do. And I today was, I think today I've reached a peak of having to try and disentangle a lot of the stuff that's being said. The dogs are going, dogs are barking, I'm going to ignore them. And in particular, I have seen on the newspapers that the the writers are putting one piece of information next to another piece of information in a way that is very um, disturbing and it's almost designed to upset people and particularly upset the over 70s who are being advised that they may be asked in a f in some days or some weeks to self-isolate. Now for a, for, a, for a start, there isn't clear information about what that actually means. Um, there is criticism by the Scottish government, which I would actually agree with. I don't think we are getting enough information from people who deal with um, people, vulnerable people to say actually what the risks really are, because we're looking at one risk, which is the virus, but we're not looking at other risks like isolation, mental health issues, just plain, plain old fashioned loneliness and sadness that comes if we isolate people. And I think that those people who are suggesting this should really go and spend a day on their own without human contact and see how that feels. Because I honestly feel that many of the people who throw these words around and talk about it may not have ever had that experience. They may not have ever had to spend a day, 24 hours on their own without being able to see someone face to face and it's a very big shift from one minute you know everything's all right go to work I mean seriously we've had people saying oh yeah go for it. and now suddenly this this very big shift and I do think that we need to take a moment and be sensible and think these things through and um, really 
I found today trying to read between the lines, trying to find out if it was safe to do, was probably harder than all the times I was travelling in... I was travelling some very some areas that people would call very dangerous, like South Africa, um, Johannesburg. But when I was there, I was getting very good information about from the locals on, yes, this is you can walk around this area. No, you can't walk around this area. Yes, you can take this car. No, you can't do this. And so most of the time, I found that the information, if I asked the right questions, I was getting really good information. There is no really good information coming out at the moment at, to help people understand what the risks are and what they should be doing and particularly the media um, certain websites and certain newspapers on their front covers are really highlighting worst case scenarios and trying to scare people they're trying to create panic and this is the reason um, I know when the World War II broke out there was a lot of argument about um, the, the how much the press were allowed to say about certain things and uh, while I'm not condoning censorship or anything like that I do think that the writers um, and the people who are responsible for the front covers of daily newspapers need to take a moment and say if they are writing in one line about the over 70s being asked to self-isolate and then the next line saying that people will be put in prison if they don't quarantine they are misleading the public. And I will say that right now, that's misleading and that is trying to create panic for older people. And it's, I, I'm, <laughs> I think it's inhumane to um, try to create panic in older people and I think the newspapers need to stop and think about what they're doing. And um, quite, quite frankly, um, I think, I question why somebody would write this on the front cover of paper. I mean, are they trying to sell a newspaper? Are they trying to create panic so that people will buy the newspaper to know what's going on when they're misinforming anyway? And um, I know this sounds like a very judgmental video, which it, it probably is, but I would say this because so many people are confused and so many people are finding it difficult to know what's going on. And the answer is, it's difficult to know what's going on because you've been told lots of different things that contradict each other. There is very, very poor information at the moment and it's a lot like, I hate to say the word, Brexit. Where you're being told, this is what's happening, this is what's going to happen. Do I know what's going on? Do I know what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> and we'd all be a lot better off if people would just say, we don't know. We don't know. This is one idea. This may come out in a couple of days. This may not happen. Instead of scaremongering and trying to control people through fear, because that's what it's about. It's about saying, oh, look, you can see my washing. So <laughs> I got my washing done today just in case, just in case I, I don't get a chance to do, do things I want to do. So anyway, this is a bit long, and, I'm, and I appreciate that. Um, thanks for watching, um, if you still are, <laughs> when I'm being so kind of, condemning about certain things but I think it's really important that we become aware of where we are being misinformed and we're being lied to and we need to take a breath and we need to stop listening to sources that have lied to us before we need to stop transmitting and sharing and repeating information and misinformation about this virus unless we are sure of its origin, okay? So just, if somebody sends you something, go to the bottom, check out what institute it's supposed to be from. Is it a real institute? Is it a real scientific um, organization? If in doubt, please, please, please go to the NHS website. Please, please, please go to reputable web websites like, for example, the Mayo Clinic um, or other big hospitals and go to those websites and look at the information there. If you are not on the internet, please, please, please ask a friend. Ring a friend. You remember the old, you know, who wants to be a millionaire? Ring a friend. Ring a friend. Somebody you know who can say to you, let me look it up for you. Let's look at the exact information, the exact advice that's being given, and also be aware that that advice may change within a few days. This is a very rapidly changing situation, and I'm surprised 
I am very surprised at how quickly things have developed. And it is it, it, it can cause, pan cause panic and, and can be quite scary. But what I would say is, please remember that this is, this is also, although it's new, people are experts. There are medical experts out there. There are medical experts on things like how important it is for people to have social interaction. There are medical experts who are around to talk about when somebody's having chemo, when somebody's having a transplant, when somebody has a poor immune system, what kind of risks they should and can take if they want to. And how important it is through this for us to stay healthy, yeah, to stay active. Look, I've got my Zumba t-shirt on and I'm gonna be doing a live stream with Zumba tomorrow. I'm not doing it, I'm, I'm watching it. <laughs> and I'm very excited about that. I'm gonna be doing a live class with people from around the world. But it's also important that we don't just sit and watch the TV because that's no good for your heart. And it's still, you know, rated as the biggest killer in the UK, heart disease. So we have to also take care of our lives. And that means being with our friends. And, you know, if we can't be with friends physically, give them a call, say hello, text each other. We can do lots of crazy things. But most importantly, we just need to be sensible. You know, as my grandma says, just be normal, just be normal. And we will have to adapt, we will have to change. And I mean, let's face it, I've traveled around the world and I've done, I've adapted so many times to different cultures and to what's safe to do. Is the air safe here? No, I might have to go somewhere else. And, um, you know, whether I have to cover my head or not, and if I have to wear gloves, if it's safe for me to, use a bathroom, you know, um, and do I have to bring my own toilet paper? <laughs> it's always a good one. So we can adapt and we can evolve and we will get through this. One way or another, we will get through this, but this will, like so many other situations in life, it will show us who we are. <laughs> so the people who decided to stockpile, <laughs> sorry, that was funny, people who decided to stockpile hand sanitizers to sell on Amazon, who now are stuck with loads of thousands of of hand sanitizers. I think this is a big lesson for them, for those people. And we all have our own lessons in this, you know, because for me, I'm, I'm one of those people who always runs out of things and has to run to the shop at the last minute. So I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to be having a few more little things in the house so I don't have to run out. And, but most importantly, I think we just have to, you know, as Barack Obama was saying, take care of each other. And and we, you know, really respect each other's choices as well. So if somebody's deciding they do want to travel to London, that is their choice, okay? And um, not to tell other people how to live their lives, but to be there for those who um, who want to have social interaction with us if we, we feel up to that as well. So that we don't um, stigmatise people for being over 70 years old because that is just so cruel and also share information in a sensible and kind way so that we're not um, creating little panics or misunderstandings. And I think one of the things I'm looking at at the moment, I might be wrong about this, so I'm just gonna suggest this. If you have a pet <laughs> and there are older people around, perhaps consider sharing your pet with somebody who's older or helping them with things like dog walking and stuff like that. So. Um, there are other things we can think about to try and share the love and spread the love around. And if nothing else, finding ways to be more loving and kind to each other at the moment. So I hope this helps. And uh, I will just share one thing. This is not advice, but it is something that maybe people don't know about. In Bhutan, uh, which is a, a place that's a lot like Nepal up in the mountains near India, when the monks and the nuns... Uh, get to a certain level of training. One of the things that they do is they go off and they stay in a cave or a little hut on their own for three months, no, I think it's three years, three months, three weeks and three days, something like that. And it's part of their training to go and live in isolation. Now I've never done that. I don't recommend it because I've done it. And I question sometimes, um, uh, if that's right for most people. Um, apparently the way they get their supplies is they text somebody and they say, I'm out of toilet roll, and if they're using toilet roll. But this is something that people do do 
if they are monks and they are nuns. So there is a possibility that we can do this if it is our choice. Um, and so that is something that we can do. And the one thing that I would share uh, from times that I have lived or traveled in isolation uh, through my own choice again is when I have spent time walking alone in the mountains and I have um, not spoken to anybody either because there was nobody there or because I didn't speak the language, I didn't speak any Spanish. And I spent time in silence. It was very important for me and it was very challenging, but it was ultimately a, a great time for me and a great gift for me to, to deal with all the stuff that I had to deal with. But one of the most important things about spending time alone and away from the people that we love, and I think this is what happens when you live in a cave and you're sort of meditating for three years or three months, three days, three weeks, whatever, is that when we don't have that social interaction, we don't have that conscious contact, one of the things that does happen is we realize and I realized how deeply connected I am to all other human beings or other beings on the planet and how deeply connected I was to my family and again it goes back to that thing about intuition and instinct that in that silence we can hear that connection so clearly and so powerfully and that sense of love and we know how loved we are and how much we love others and sometimes in that silence and in that separation there is more connection so sometimes absence does make the heart grow fonder and it teaches us so much about ourselves and about others but we have to respect that this is not for everybody you know this is a choice nuns monks and I made for a while and it can be quite cruel to isolate people against their will. And it's basically we're talking about solitary confinement, which there are laws about putting people in, in prisons um, and, and any kind of incarceration. So before we swing to some kind of system, any kind of system, we have to think long and hard about whether it is safe, whether it is kind and because we are actually human beings yeah we are human beings is it humane to do this to somebody would you do it to a dog would you put a dog somewhere and not allow them any contact any cuddles any strokes I think the NSPCC might have something to say about that <laughs> we might actually say it's cruel and I think we have to really consider before we take any action is is it kind you know, is, is this trying to protect people so much that we actually end up destroying them? And that's something we really have to think about quite carefully. So deep today, and um, I hope that really helps. And, um, you know, I think these are questions that we must ask ourselves before we go along with any new practices. Okay? Lots of love. Oh.